Joining me now is Dave Pern of Soul Asylum, whose latest album, Hurry Up and Wait, is now available, as is a book of Dave's collected lyrics called Loud Fast Words. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, man. What's going on, Christian? Uh, not much. Uh, so uh, I wanted to show off the fact that uh, I actually have a CD of this. I think that uh, they're not easy to come by physical media right now. Very because... impressed. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Amazon was willing to send it. Oh, see, you have to show me that literally yours is bigger than mine. Uh, I have a CD, but, and I, uh, I was going to comment, actually, I do love all these pictures of uh, people sleeping on tour. Uh, right. You've found plenty of places to do that uh, throughout yeah. the course. <laughs> uh, I wanted to start off talking about, uh, about the book, uh, and I wanted to kind of talk about how that came about, sort of this collection of your lyrics. And obviously, Loud Fast Words is a play on the original name of the band, which was uh, Loud Fast Rules. This is correct. Uh, yeah, I mean, the story is that my manager said, "Do you ever think about making a book?" And I went, "Yeah." yeah. <laughs> and then I thought, "Well, I don't really want to make a memoir. That's kind of been beat to the ground in a Spinal Tap kind of way." Yeah. Uh, so I thought, "Oh, a collection of my lyrics. I think I would like to do that." Um, and it really turned around pretty quickly. I mean, it, it was kind of in my hand before I, I was like, holy cow, you know. Um, so it, it was a good experience. And uh, now I, it's a thing where you can see all my lyrics on the internet and they are all incorrect. <laughs> but now that I have a document that so people can get it right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I like that, uh, you know, you actually took the time to talk a little bit about each of the songs. Now, I'm sure that in doing that process, there must have been a few that you hadn't thought about in a while. What was the ratio of sort of like, oh, that's a hidden gem to, oh, I'd rewrite that right now if I could? Uh, I like to think that that ratio goes, well, more. <laughs> more you know, gem? Yeah, more yeah. gem as, as the records get more gemmier more gem gemstone-esque yes uh, but uh yeah i mean there you know it, it's like some of it i go god that's pretty impressive i can't believe i wrote that when i was 20 and then some of it i go oh i was still kind of trying to figure out what i was trying to do um it, it varies pretty wildly in the earlier stuff um but yeah, I mean, I, it's hard for me to, to, even though I just relived the whole experience through making the book, it's hard for me to tell how, uh, how someone else would perceive that, is it, as in, is, is, am I getting better at what I'm trying to do <laughs> right. as this goes along? Um, so, you know, you know, you don't really know, and I find things. I mean, me and Janine had a couple funny things where we, the only version of a song we had was on a cassette tape, and I'm just screaming bloody murder, and it's <laughs> absolutely indecipherable. Right. You cannot tell. I mean, we listened to it over and over again. I couldn't get, I could get but three words out of it. So I mean, <laughs> it was frustrating, but it sure. was kind of funny. Um, so most of it, uh, you know, just, it, it is what it is and it's, I'll take the credit and the blame, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, and obviously, you know, the, the book probably would have, uh, spiraled out of control if you hadn't just stuck to album tracks. Like if you'd done, you know, movie soundtracks and B sides and stuff like that. And I'm only bringing it up because I noticed, uh, two of my favorite songs weren't in there. Uh, can't even tell from clerks and, uh, candy from a stranger, which of course is not on the album candy from a stranger. Wait, those aren't in there. I don't think I saw them unless uh, unless I skimmed through the book too fast and I'm asking you a dumb question right now. I was looking for them though. I mean, did we get Can't Even Tell and Candy from a Stranger in the book? I believe so. Okay, so then I don't know how to read. That's what well, we're no, talking there's about. A, there's a final chapter that oh. has kind of oddities in it. You know and what, I got- where that would be. 
I had it sent to me digitally by uh, some promotional uh, people. Yeah. So I may not have the final version of the book. So yeah. I'm glad to hear that. But I was yeah. hoping to actually get an actual copy of the book, you know, one day when bookstores yeah. open again. So that's good to know that uh, those are in there. Uh, I have one more song lyric related question that to me, I oh. feel like. <laughs> I was I, looking for my copy, but oh. the, the, Computer was on top of it. <laughs> well, you got to have it level. Yeah, there it is. Loud, fast words. So now you'll you'll be able to prove that uh, I did not do a good job researching the book. And well, or or I didn't one. do a good job <laughs> including those two. I thought they were in here somewhere. Well, yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a question. Andy well, from a stranger. Okay, so right there is the proof. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you it, are a writer. What you don't know, you, what? Yeah. you don't know how to read. There's can't even tell. Yeah. So see, now that just you just proved the, that everybody, including myself, needs to actually go out and buy this book. Yeah, get the real book. You gotta get the real book. You know, don't, don't get it digitally. Yeah, sorry, I gotta put it back under the computer. Yeah, that's all right. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I know that uh, that sort of thing happens in rock and roll history. Like I think the song waiting for the sun isn't on the doors album waiting for the sun but the song okay. candy from a stranger is not on the album candy from a stranger that is correct but uh, i remember it was uh, it was always part of the the live set at that time and i'm like oh this is a great song but uh is that just one of this is when the album came out did you immediately go like wait why didn't we put that on there we're just going to play it live anyway or is uh, that like the radio the, not the radio but uh, the uh, the record company getting involved yeah, yeah, it was one of those things where it just wasn't, you know, like the band or whoever, you know, the songs that end up on the records are the songs that everyone can kind of agree on. Sure. Um, but I wanted it on the record, and it's certainly different. It's a really fun song to play live, and it it's very different every time we play it. So we, I even went to uh, Diddy's house, where P. Diddy has yes. his studio or whatever. Uh, and and this guy did a remix of Candy from a Stranger. We were trying oh, wow. to figure out sort of how to present it or whatever. Sure. And I had Henry Butler, my favorite piano player from New Orleans, play on the track. And uh, there's a couple pretty good versions of it. If you play your cards right, maybe I could Maybe I could find a couple of those because I've always kind of wondered what happened to them. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> but it's, you know, it just got longer, which, yeah. I don't know. But that's but, the beauty of uh, when you do a song live. If your, your four-minute song ends up being eight and a half minutes and people have fun, then, you know, it's fine. Uh, there's, a, there's a question. This is my last, like, lyrical-related question. I feel like you should get asked this all the time. I've never heard you oh. ask this. It's uh, so your song never really been from made to be broken. There's a lyric where you ask the question, you know, where will you be in 1993? And I assume it must not have been lost on you that the year 1993 ended up being, you know, a very successful year for the band. And did you think about that, uh, you know, when you would sing it? And also, was it just it 93 rhymed with B? Was it that simple? Or were you th thinking about like, oh, I wonder what the next seven years it was like? that simple it just <laughs> rhymed and you know that's the first time that that ever occurred to me really that, that like i don't know 93 was a good year for the yeah. band that never crossed my mind interesting I, I have been lucky enough to say where will you be in 2023 yeah uh but that's gonna come to pass and then i'm gonna have to change it to 2033 30 yeah. Right, what you said. Yeah, let's just hope that in 2023 we're not all you know spending most of our days in our our houses and uh, and all that. You know, by by then at least. Wow. Um, I, wow. I would, yeah. Well, you know, I've got the uh, the uh, the uh, the pessimistic view on this. Uh, I do want to talk about the new album, "Hurry Up and Wait." Uh, I know that it must be very awkward to promote it when the you know you're not able to go out on tour i was actually at the last show that you guys played in los angeles on yeah. uh, march 11th i thought it was a great show i was very excited for the album and that was sort of this day where everything was like oh should i be going to something oh is there going to be that concert tonight and all that 
Uh, talk about sort of, you know, having a great show. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, tour's over. Yeah, you're not going to do a book tour either. Uh, you're going to have to go home now. Well, I mean, the good news is that the, the, I think the tour went really well. I mean, uh, the crowds were great. Local H was a great opening act. The band was really firing on all cylinders and we were playing a lot of new stuff in the set. And it seemed to be going over. So I was really, <laughs> I was really glad we made it all the way through LA. Yeah. Uh, that was a fun crowd. I mean, we, that was a real good crowd for us in LA as far as just, I don't know, the attitude or something. Um, LA can be, you never kind of never know what you're going to get. Um, so yeah, there we were in San Diego the next day and <laughs> Janine knocked on my door and said, tour's over. <laughs> and it just had this sucking sense of like, I think me and Ryan both felt like my guitar player was like, God, it feels like we, we didn't finish, you know, like something's yeah. it's incomplete. Um, so it's very strange to go home to Minneapolis because after you're on tour for a month or two, you need a little alone time. But this is way too much <laughs> alone time, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, as uh, I I'm sure it's uh, occurred to you in the band that, uh, you know, there, there will come a time when bands are able to play live. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, if, if there's whatever, you know, you pick a day that you feel like, okay, well, we can start having shows again, I don't know, September 1st, you just want to pick a day do you guys feel like, all right, well, we'd be all right heading out there and playing or would it kind of really depend? Like, Oh, we kind of only want to do a tour through this part of the country or are you pretty open to just playing and feeling like, all right, if the venue's open, they're going to have the, the best interests of us as performers and the fans in mind. That's a very good question. And I'm very sort of devastated to not know the answer yeah. to that question it's very difficult to book anything so we've we've rescheduled these shows i think there's five shows left on our tour for october who's to say what's going to be going on in october but uh you know we had a couple things on the books already but at this point it's kind of impossible to predict when we're going to be able to go out again you know yeah, no, and that's that's sort of the thing. And I guess it's like, you know... When, and very frustrating having a record out and a yeah. book and not being able to go out and play and stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know? Well, how do you feel about the the sort of the, the live streaming performances that you and Ryan were doing, you know, sort of the mostly the week leading up to the release? Uh, I thought there were some really interesting choices in, in songs that you did too. Uh, I believe uh, it was, uh, I think it was... Uh, little house on the edge which is like a like a what like a, a bonus track basically from men the horse they rode in on and mm -hmm. i you know and, and i believe I, i'm not even going to say it's not in the book i'm just assuming that's not in the book but if it is it's so, not in the book okay so i'm right about something <laughs> why don't we put that one in the book <laughs> I, or or village idiot or <laughs> wow you have to get these there's a there's a version of that CD that has those three songs on it. Uh, that, we were trying uh, to find that CD and we couldn't find it. Well, why didn't you call me? I have it. Oh man, <laughs> what's up with that? Uh, but uh, so it, it's sort of interesting because you know you can you could play stuff from the new album and then you know some of the songs that people know the best. But uh, like I know you did P Nine in one of those, so it was it's really like an eclectic mix and is it really just like well i'm playing for my living room so let's play some weird different stuff and uh see how people respond to it well we've done how many of these things not nine to seven uh and so it's like six songs per thing and we haven't repeated anything we've only played one cover and the the idea i think is to well my concept here is to not repeat myself Right. Which just means that I got to dig deeper and deeper into <laughs> right. the catalog. And some of it's stuff that Brian has never played before. Uh, some of it is stuff I haven't even thought about in years. Um, 
So like Little House on the Edge, <clears throat> nobody's heard that song except you. Yeah, <laughs> <apparently. just> me. <laughs> um, but uh, it seemed appropriate, you know? I was like, it just felt right. And I'm like, oh gosh, here's one. So it's been kind of going that way. Like, uh, you know, we're talking about maybe doing some things electric or something, but this seems to, you know, as simple as possible, which, which kind of, uh, it's keeping more to the acoustic side of things which is spread out all over the records and it's fun and it's really good practice for me. However, all the mistakes stay in. So you can, when you're live streaming, you can, uh, yeah. we were a little un, under rehearsed on some things and uh, you know, thank goodness for Ryan. He's just such a great guitarist. I'll, I'll end up, I'll be, I'll be making a chord with my hand from, 30 years ago and I'll go, what chord is this anyway? Because I never knew. I don't know right. exactly what it is, you know. Uh, well, let's uh, talk about the album, Hurry Up and Wait. And uh, I, I remember in reading about it before it came out that uh, you recorded it at the same studio you used, I guess, uh, 30 years ago. Was that for uh, the Twin right. Tone albums or? Yeah, Made to be Broken okay. and While You Were Out were, and Clammed It. Those were all recorded at the same building yes so uh what was what was that feeling like to just kind of walk in and you know be 30 years further along and uh you know i i i would assume you feel like i'm i'm a better songwriter i'm a better player now all these things so uh was it but was it still comfortable getting back into that studio you know i gotta say it, it was pretty great you know i mean everything else in the neighborhood has changed except for that studio and one German restaurant. <laughs> Everything else has changed. Um, so standing out in front, it all looks different, but being there is incredibly comfortable. I mean, I hadn't really had that kind of experience in a studio where you come back after all those years and it feels kind of like home. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time in that building Twin Tones offices were upstairs. Husker Du's offices were upstairs. We used to practice in a back room of that building. Uh, so it feels great. And, and it also is kind of, we never really record in Minneapolis. So we'd always go to LA or we go to New York or we go to friggin' Florida or wherever. And, uh, you know, this is, you get to go home and you get to collect your 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 notebooks and your, you get to kind of regroup every day and you know we were kind of in a really good spot where it was like all right well we got this many songs when do you guys want to work again okay let's go in and do so it was very uh casual in a in a comfortable sort of way where you don't feel this pressure that there's you're paying all this money to be in New York and all these people are coming by that are paying so much money for this record <laughs> that they're going to be standing over your shoulder and this, that, and the other thing, all that was gone. And uh, it just makes for such a, a more creative sort of an atmosphere. And uh, me and Michael and John Fields have worked together on the last, I think, three records. So we have a very comfortable dialogue and uh, rapport. And uh, yeah, I mean, the studio used to be terrifying to me. And it just got more and more terrifying as the expenses went up. Um, I always felt kind of, oh my God, I gotta do this right. Or, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ruin the whole day that we're spending so much money on, and I don't think that helped my, my uh, whatever that is, my, yeah. you know, my attitude just to sort of express myself. If you're kind of feeling a little edgy or whatever, I mean, maybe for some things, edgy is good. I don't know. Sure. But uh, you know, you have. We recorded a record at, uh, at Electric Lady in New York, and the opposite of that is 
uh, pachyderm in Cannon Falls. And there's nothing out there. So you can walk out of the studio and take a beautiful walk in the woods and clear your head and come back to the studio. It's just gorgeous Minnesota nature. Steve Jordan was out there, the guy that produced uh, <clears throat> can, uh, the horse they rode in on. And he would stand outside and look up and, and just talk about how he had never seen so much sky because he was like a born and raised in New York kind of guy. So he was way out of his element. <laughs> and when we were working with Steve in, at Electric Lady in New York, he's just totally comfortable in that environment. And that's great too, because you can walk out of the studio and you're in the village and there's just so much going on and it kind of clear your head. And like that. So there's, you know, there's good things to, to both sides of the equation, you know, you don't, want too much distraction. Um, you know, there, there's a certain amount of you that has to sort of, you know, really focus in on this and nothing else really matters when you're in the studio. But uh, yeah, I think your environment changes the, the way that things happen. And uh, this was very organic, I guess, feeling. The uh, the week that the album came out, I, I remember you uh, talked to Eddie Trunk on Sirius XM for a long time, and it was something I'd never heard you talk about before, which is just how hard you guys all had to work on Grave Dancers Union. And then obviously that's, you know, the huge big breakthrough record, so I'm sure it pays dividends, but does it does it get to a point where maybe that's because I guess that was your first album for Columbia and it was there just so much of what you're talking about. Everybody's like, no, this note has to be exactly right. This has to be right. We we're picking the singles and all that. Uh, is that really sort of the, the beast of what it was like to make a record in the early nineties that honestly is just sort of not out there anymore because people don't buy records the way they used to. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, uh, a million dollar record compared to, I don't know what we spent on our new record, 10 grand or something ridiculous, you know? So you sure. could spend that money, you know? And when that, when, when things are sort of at that level where you're being bankrolled to be in New York or Los Angeles, you just, you just blow money out the, it's just, rental cars, whatever you want in them, whatever it is. It's just, it's a lot of money gets just yeah. blown. Basically. Yeah, no, I mean, it, like you're talking about, yeah, you know, rental cars and like, hey, what's for lunch and, you know, and, and all that. And then yeah, before you know it, that's, that, that's where the, yeah, the 10 grand for this album, you know, would have, you know, been lunch for a couple of weeks on something in New York. So. We were, you know, Michael Beinhorn is, is a perfectionist. And uh, he's notoriously, uh, I don't know if he'd be, I would say he's difficult to work with, but I would say that he won't take anything that is not just right. So we worked in this studio called The Magic Shop uh, for about five days working on Grave Dancers. And he kept going, what's that sound? What's that? Wait, wait. We couldn't figure out what he was hearing. And we had to leave. And it, it turned out that it was like a screw in a vent somewhere or something. <laughs> wow. you know? So a lot of time setting up, a lot of time yeah. moving a microphone in front of an amp. You know, he'd take three hours doing that. And sometimes by that time, you, you kind of you start to lose the spark or whatever. So John is not like that at all. It's very fast. And I like that. It's very fluid. Um, but gosh, to Michael's credit, he makes great sounding records. I mean, I love what he did with um, Soundgarden and uh, every record he's made sounds awesome. And that's because he puts the time and money into it. And uh, it's true. I don't know who can afford to do that anymore. You know, except for, uh, I don't know, whoever's on the top 10 or whatever. 
Yeah, I mean, you got to figure like anybody who I guess plays stadiums when that's you know allowed again. Those you know like if if Paul McCartney wants to make a new record, Metallica wants to make a record. Those are people who can spend that kind of money. But I think for the most part, you know, you probably have a lot of management that's like you could spend all that money on a record, or how about you just go out on a tour and play an old album from beginning to end? Why don't you just do that? Because we, as you know, the management, we get so much more money off of you being on the road. So. Uh, you know, I, I can, I can sort of see that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting to, when I hear the story of somebody who makes a record in the way you're talking about, uh, it'll be interesting, but, uh, you know, you always hear about everybody, you know, that's like, Oh, you know, we're all kind of spread out. So I emailed the drum track and then he emailed the vocal and all that. But, uh, have, have you done much like that? And does it, how much does it take away if you're not in the studio together? I mean, I know that not everything is playing live all at the same time, but all actually working and playing together. Is it something that you can tell? Like, even if it's not one of your records, if you're listening, you're like, oh, there's no way those guys were in the studio together because you can, it just lacks something. Uh, gosh, I mean, I think that we were probably more in the studio together on this record than the previous record. Mm -hmm. Um, where we kind of would start it out in LA with the rhythm track. Me and Michael and John would sort of lay down the basic tracks and then Winston would play on it. And then whoever the guitar player was at the time would play on it. Um, but this record was pretty, pretty much, yeah, pretty much traditionally dudes coming all in together and <laughs> right. playing together and making tunes. Can I tell on other records? It, it really depends, you know? I mean, the difference between, uh, uh, you know, a Clash record and a Cars record, yeah, you can pretty much tell what the difference is by <laughs> listening to it. Yeah. But I mean, you can listen to, you know, I love hip hop music. But I mean, that's, it's, it's, nobody's ever in a, Kyle Rogers came down to our studio and we were working on uh, the horse they rode in on and he was working with Madonna and he's just in the studio alone all day, every day. And we were all four of us with three people working on the record every day. He'd come in and go, wow, it looks like Hollywood. Or people would come and go, <laughs> wow, you guys are doing this old school. And I'm like, That's the only way we know how to do it, you know? Yeah, and then, you, and then you wonder, did Madonna ever even actually hear that record? You know, she's like, all right, I'm done. So whatever you want to do, Niles, that's fine. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so the the album Hurry Up and Wait that I uh, referred to a few times. Now, I, I understand that uh, sort of doing this pre-promotion, the way that these work now, that uh, the album did very well. Uh, I, I heard that mentioned in passing recently. So you had the pre-sale that, uh, that people like and... Uh, this would be the time that you'd probably already be back out on the road right now, but uh, it's, yeah. it's, I guess, good to just keep it out there. And, you know, I guess there's so many ways that you can look at the music industry right now where it's like, oh, it's harder to get out there, but it's like for people who really like a band, you're at least able to communicate with them directly, sort of the, the live streaming we're talking about. So if you do put out like a, you know, a little video that goes with something, they at least, you're able to speak directly to your audience, which was probably a lot harder than, you know, having record company interns call MTV to try and, you know, have a song get played a lot. So uh, what, how do you feel uh, it's, it's gone in terms of increasing the awareness of it? Obviously you were playing songs live from it, before it was out but i mean the you know the songs that you did at the la show i'd never heard any of them and i think they sounded great the crowd seemed to really like them but you know you have the actual traditional you know you release a single so i believe uh if i told you it was the single so i kind of wanted to talk a little bit about when it is an album like this and it's not you know the big you know multi-million dollar uh, record company sort of thing we're talking about decisions about releasing singles does that is it just like oh this is the one that'll sound best live or how, what is that process like for for an album like this uh well traditionally it's kind of a conversation that i sort of back out of a little bit because i want to hear <laughs> sure. what the other people in the band are, are saying and i want to hear uh 
you know, what the manager thinks sort of and what the thing is that whoever, whoever's picking the single, they're the ones that have to work it. I mean, it's to me, it's like pick whatever you want to work, you know, um, but here in, and we put out a dead letter as a first taste of the record, which was really unorthodox as far as I'm concerned. But I like, I like the idea. I was like, oh, that's great. I mean, I didn't think that was going to be a choice. Uh, so yeah, I mean, typically I will kind of go with the flow. I mean, at that point, I'm done writing the record. The record is complete. <clears throat> And whoever picks a single, yeah, it's 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 on them now to push it through. So uh, fighting with that element isn't really. I mean, I'm sure I've done it. And I don't think so. I mean, I know <laughs> I've done it. I'm like, oh, you should pick this one, not that one. Right. And in fact, I did that too much at some point. Like I really pissed off the record company because I didn't like any of their choices. Um, so, you know, it, it just depends. Sometimes there's just a song, it's just so obvious that like, you know, we weren't really, I don't think anyone was sitting around wondering if a uh, runaway train should be a single, except for me. I mean, I, I just, it was just another song on the record, but people reacted to it in a, like in a different way. Um, do and you do you have, feel like you had a song was like you know what's you know what's better than Runaway Train like you know were you was that an instance where you were like pushing for what about without a trace or even the sun well we something? had I mean like somebody to shove was the last song we recorded for the record so it was still new to me yeah um, so I didn't really know how it was going to work and. Uh, you know it, it just it was the right choice and black gold had already come out by the time runaway train came out so there was enough uh intuitive kind of choices that i guess made sense to me um so yeah i mean i don't i don't i don't really care how people come to the record but yeah. i'm just i was raised on albums and i know that you know, forever kids are, they're into singles and, and you only hear one song or whatever the case may be. If you go to England, it's just a little bit different. It's even more that way. Um, and now you got all the streaming and the this, that, and the other thing. So you lose track of this document called an album. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's hard to keep track of it. It changes and you're supposed to go out and, you know, I don't know. I, I really, it's kind of sad because I still buy vinyl. And now, you know, I've been through this period where, you know, you've only got vinyl records and then CDs come out and they cost twice as much. <laughs> yeah. Right? Sure. And they got to have a bonus track on them to get people to buy CDs. Yeah, that's that true. Happening, I believe. And now I just went to Amoeba in LA and the CDs are $2, the used ones. Yep. And the new records are 35 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not the coolest kind of thing to me to kind of keep trying to get people to buy yeah. the Jimi Hendrix record on every single format or whatever it may be. It's then they stop making the CD player and then you're kind of screwed and this, that, and the other thing. So it's weird. And I, you know, to some people, music, I think is more disposable. I always think about that. Like, Oh, you pay a buck for all these crappy MP3s and then your phone dies and you go, eh. Yeah. Just time I to get some new songs. I'm looking yeah. at my, I'm looking at, this is what I'm looking at right here. My record collection. Oh yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and they're all just kind of, precious yeah. things I need to have, you know? Yeah, well, that's the interesting thing because, uh, I, you know, I grew up with, well, first cassettes and then mostly uh, CDs. And uh, the album, as the way you're talking about it, was always really important to me. Uh, my wife grew up just listening to the radio. She's more of a pop person than a rock person. So it's like, if, if we were to listen to Sirius, the, the 90s channel, she'll, she'll know all the hits 
but if there's like an album cut from anybody, she's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what this is, you know? And it's, it's such a very different way to consume music, which you talk to younger people now, it's like the, the idea of buying an album from even somebody they love, it's like, oh yeah, I really like that Lady Gaga song or that Taylor Swift song. Although, I mean, I guess she's a bad example because she seems to be the one person who still sells albums. But just the idea, I guess it's, it's mostly... I guess people who are older and maybe it's a rock thing where it's like, no, I want to, I want to hear the whole album. You know, I don't, I don't want to hear like the three best songs from Aerosmith rocks. I want to listen to it from beginning to end, you know? And uh, I, I want to listen to Soul Simon and the horse they rode in on with the three bonus tracks. You gotta have it all, man. <laughs> but just... yeah, well, there's, there's that too. And uh, the, uh, the sort, sort of as, a, as we're winding down, what I was wondering, sort of asking about the singles question, was it, how much of it is there, you know, when the album's done and you're like, okay, these are the songs on it. Do you think about it in the way of like, okay, these will be the most fun ones to play live? Or is it, is it not even really about that? Is it just you guys kind of jam together and then you see what feels natural? Or do you tend to know when the album's done Oh, these are the three that I think we should try putting into the set. Uh, I think that the as the uh, as the as the uh, time passes, the the primary objective is to write a song that the band is going to enjoy playing. I think that's probably priority number one. So, if everyone's playing it and it's feeling good and it's fun to play, that's a really good sign. You know, if I'm trying to push something that's complicated and convoluted and it works, it'll go on the record and then we will play it until it sounds right. It's still kind of, it's, you know, it's not the kind of thing that me and Ryan will play during our live stream on acoustic because it doesn't, sure. doesn't, you know, lend itself to that. Although we, we do try every now and then to do something electric acoustically and you never really know what's going to work. Like I didn't think somebody to shove was going to work on acoustic guitars, but it, it works great. You know? Yeah. I mean, did you work that up specifically for the MTV Unplugged or had you tried it acoustically uh, before that just to see what it sounded like? Or did you have I, to actually reinvent it for that performance? I think, I think it was the first time that we played it acoustic and I think having the string section gave me the confidence to just see the do 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 I can hear that in my head and I'm like that's gonna work. Um so yeah so now we so yeah I think that was the inspiration to play things acoustically uh yeah. or whatever. You know we did one in Canada too which <laughs> Yeah, you kind of try to adapt to a different uh, scenario. And, you know, we're into that. We're, yeah. We're into sort of uh, you know, we've we've referenced, obviously, some of the, the biggest songs you guys have, uh, you know, a lot of them from Grave Dancers Union, Let Your Dim Light Shine. There's a few of those. So I would say probably uh, Runaway Train and Somebody to Shove tend to be the ones that you know, there might be a night where maybe you don't play both of them, but do you feel like there's this responsibility of, okay, there's some percentage of the crowd that's here for those songs. Uh, I, I should at least make sure we get one of them. And are there nights where you're just like, I just, I just don't want to sing it again tonight. Or do you still have an affinity for these songs that you wrote, you know, almost 30 years ago? Uh, yes. The last thing. I mean, I, when, Runaway Train got so big, I kind of was a little put off by the whole thing. I, I took it out of the set. And uh, so we weren't playing it. And, uh, you know, I get inevitably people going, gosh, we, we drove 10 hours to get here. I brought my baby with me. I really <laughs> wanted to share the experience of having Runaway Train. I just felt like an asshole. Sure. You know, I, and I was just like, yeah, it's, you know, three minutes and 47 seconds out of my life. <laughs> so I kind of re-embraced it and just sort of changed my attitude. And I enjoy playing it. It's fun mm -hmm. to play. It's fun to see how people react. And, uh, yeah, you know, we, we put the stuff in the set list because 
people want to hear it, you know, and you, you can follow up uh, something new with something familiar and right. you, know, you got that <laughs> relief <laughs> afterwards if they don't like the new one or whatever. Right. I mean, and you also, you don't want to be so precious that you're, you know, Radiohead don't play that song Creep. That was their first hit because they hate it. And it's like, okay, they probably have the kind of fans that maybe don't need to hear it. But, you know, it's like there's, you always see video of, you know, fans that ask for songs and then they're like, no, fuck you. We don't want to play it, you know? And it's like, all right, you're, you could just ignore the guy and, and play one of the songs you do want to play. But, uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I can see both sides of it. I'm sure, I'm sure you can at least relate to that sentiment that. Oh, yeah. Have, yeah. It's come, I've tried every single angle. Even up to going, all right, how many people here tonight want to hear a runaway train? <laughs> and if half the crowd or more raises their hand, we'll play it. And if they don't, we won't. It's as simple as that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the the last question I have is uh, I as somebody who's seen you guys live a, a bunch over the years uh, I've always enjoyed some of the more interesting uh, cover songs that you guys have done and uh, I have a question uh, that uh, somebody sent in when I, I mentioned that I was going to be talking to you uh, Dan Carroll in New Jersey it, it's a very specific moment I'm sure he won't take it personally if you don't remember but he's talking about uh, a cover song that he saw you guys do. This would have been in the nineties. He says where the lyrics are really just fuck you a lot of the time. And I was trying to say, think of like, would that be that, that Harry Nilsson song? You're breaking my heart. So fuck you. But do you remember a song that really the lyric, and maybe it's a cover song or just something that you guys messed around with that really the, the lyrics tend to just be fuck you a, a lot of the time. I think what hit, what is, what's his name? Dan. Dan. I think that what Dan is referring to is a song that the Meat Puppets covered, which is like, oh my God, I don't know. It's like a, not the flesh tones, but the, it, it just says fuck you over and over again. Fuck nice. you, Dan, I mean, fuck you, Dan, I mean, fuck you. And I think we were, you know, ending sets playing that with the Meat Puppets when we were touring with them and stuff. Okay. I'm yeah. pretty sure that's that's what he's thinking of. Well, there you go. I'm sure he'll appreciate the answer to that question. And uh, yeah, I remember, now you mentioned that. Uh, I remember, this, what was that like? I don't know, somewhere in the last 10 years, you guys toured with the Meat Puppets. So that was, uh, that was a, a cool bill to have. And like you said, you were out on tour with Local H. And uh, in theory, when the tour resumes, you, you'll head back out on the road with those guys, I would assume. Yeah, I think. Are they on for the reschedules? <laughs> Hard to know, yeah. Hard to hard to know what anybody's gonna there. do. But the place will be there. Obviously, it, people want to keep track of all that stuff. They can always go to soulasylum.com, and uh, I know there's there's a Twitter for people who do that, just at Soul Asylum. But the most important thing is, of course, hurry up and wait. That is, uh, of course, uh, a phrase that is very prophetic in these times because that's really all we do is not even the hurry up, just wait. <laughs> But uh, Dave, uh, I, I can't uh, say enough how much I appreciate you uh, being so generous with your time. Uh, I've uh, been a fan for a while, uh, as evidenced by some of the tracks that I have in my collection. But uh, I, uh, I appreciate you talking about it. It's always, uh, always enjoyable to hear your, your take on things. And I, I was uh, happy to be the one asking the questions this time. Thank you, Christian. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you for your time. And as you always say in the show, you're too, too kind. You're too kind. Yes, much too kind. <laughs> much friend. too kind. Thanks so much. That's uh, Dave Perner. As I mentioned, the album, Hurry Up and Wait, and of course, the book, Loud Fast Words. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thanks again to Dave Perner, and uh, we'll see you next time.